Let's get started. Welcome everybody. This is uh, Lunch with Greentown. And uh, it's a five week series of talks, as you know, on environmental topics. And Greentown is your local environmental group. We've been around for over 10 years. And we like to do fun things like plant trees, take bike rides, yeah, clean up creeks. We also have our summer internship program, and that's been a lot of fun the last three summers. You get a chance to work with the next generation. And then we do advocate for policy that we think is important. For example, last year, we reached out to the city council and talked about reach codes. So these talks will be one hour, including time for, for questions. And please use the chat to ask your questions. We are recording. Let me make sure we are recording. Hmm. Guess I have to stop share to be able to make sure about that. It does look like it's recording. I see that on my screen. Thank you. Um, I don't see them on as having been admitted yet, but a big thank you to the Parks and Rec Department. They, uh, they were the inspiration that got me going. They said, why don't you put a class together for our winter catalog? So, so I did. And I'd also like to make a, a shout out to Sereno Group. They uh, provided the funding that helped with our outreach, in particular that had in the town crier last week. They have something called 1% for Good and the Climate and Culture Fund. And I was able to tap into that. I'm going to now stop the screen share and we'll get on with the show. So this is the cue for Steve to put his slides up. Okay, well, I'll start it off. Wrong slide. Hello? I'm seeing my slides. There we go. Well, yeah, this is good. This is the overall agenda, folks. I'll give a, a little talk to start it, and then Connie will um, talk about why we should get off, get off the gas, get off natural gas. And then Steve will have the bulk of it on his really inspiring uh, work that he, uh, to demonstrate that you can make a difference. First slide. Okay, I don't wanna alarm you, but look at all that red. It is pretty alarming. The temperatures have been really hot uh, the, the polar, north polar ice cap is melting. And so this is pretty serious. Next slide. This is an alarming trend. Here we go again with that word. Up, up, up. This is the cost in billions of dollars for the natural disasters that are related to uh, climate change. Here's wildfires. This is what we see in California, of course. But uh, look at the green one here. This is severe storm costs. Yeah, this is another related one, cyclone count, but you can see that the, the weather is, well, look at what's happening in Texas this month. <laughs> a lot of money involved in dealing with the, the effects of climate change. Next slide. Here are some quotes. You recognize these people, I'll bet. Bill McKibben, winning slowly is the same as losing. If we don't win very quickly on climate change, then we will never win. That's the core truth about climate global warming is what makes it different from every other problem our political systems have faced. This is Greta Thunberg, you know her. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. And finally, the late George Schultz, he was a hundred, good for George. But he said quite a few years ago, actually, if you wait until you're boiling, you may have missed your moment. I submit that he probably would say now you have missed your moment or you not may, but you may very likely miss your moment. So, so there is a certain level of urgency here. Next slide. So this is a poll and I'm gonna launch this poll and you're gonna, the question or the statement is there is a climate crisis and time is of the essence. So this is your chance to participate out there just click where, where, okay, we got 12 people already. This is fast. You guys are quick. Um, we've got 27 participants. I, I'm looking for 27. We got 24. Do I hear 25? I guess not. We're going to end the poll. 
26, yes. Ending the poll, I will share the results. No surprise. <clears throat> well, a little bit. I am not sure. So most people agree there is a problem here, folks. Stop sharing that. Close the poll. Next slide. All right, if there is a problem, the first law of holes is if you stop, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. So where do you fit on the action continuum? Foot dragger, frozen in the headlights, participant, early adopter, leader? Well, I will tell you that Connie and Steve are leaders. And let's see how they have been leading us and how they hope to lead us. Next slide. This is Connie's. So you can grab the screen now, go to share screen. All righty. Thank you, Gary. So when we talk about electrification or electrifying your home, what we're really talking about doing is eliminating the use of natural gas and replacing those fossil fuel appliances to those powered with electric appliances. Um, it's really important that we do this for several reasons. First, as Gary had introduced to you, the gas we use in our homes is one of the most potent greenhouse gases that are out there. And they leak. All the way that the distribution process works is a very leaky process, and that makes it a fire safety hazard. Third, we now know what we didn't know a few years ago, which is how detrimental to our health natural gas in and around our home is. And finally, what's happening is the state and regulatory agencies and utilities are aware of this. And so they're adopting policies that support building electrification. And what that means is that over time, the pricing and what infrastructure they decide to uh, support favors electricity over gas. So, what is natural gas? If you were to ask me that a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have had a clue. I was always taught that natural gas was uh, more efficient and cheaper and better for us than coal, which is true, but that doesn't make it good. We've kind of been duped by the oil and gas industry. By the term they use natural, it makes us feel like it's better, but it's not. The vast majority of natural gas is made up of methane, around 97%. The result, the rest of it is just a few other chemicals that allow us to smell it so that they can catch the leaks. It accounts for one quarter of all global warming. Methane comes from both natural and sort of man-made sources and the man-made sources include extraction, uh, garbage dumps basically rotting, uh, cattle ranching, and increasingly the burning of biomasses. The part we're gonna focus on today is the man-made part, not the part that comes from insects and, and swamps and things like that. The reason we're focusing on that is because that's what we have direct control over. You can, your direct action can have a direct impact on climate change just by how much or how little natural gas you choose to use. We've evolved over time in terms of what, uh, what you use for our energy. The natural gas hasn't been around for very long. It only really took hold and, and became commercially used in the 50s. In California, we use it a lot because our geography makes it well, uh, easy to access and there's a good supply of it. But in other parts of the United States, like the South, um, the Eastern Southern part of the United States, it's hardly used at all. And in some countries like Austria and Germany, they consider it a passe technology. The reason that all of this evolves is because now uh, renewable energy is considered more efficient and more reliable than the natural gas. So why is it such a bad pollutant? Methane, it turns out, is 87 times worse than carbon dioxide in warming the planet over a 20 year period. And it leaks. 
to get from the extraction point where they extract the shale to your home, it leaks so much. It's the equivalent of 175 million cars or 240 coal power plants over a 20 year period. Looked at another way, what gets leaked, just leaked, not even used by us, could power the heating and cooking needs of 7 million homes a year. And if it makes it to your house and you burn it, it reacts to form carbon dioxide, which in and of itself is a potent greenhouse gas. And it also produces, when combusted, uh, reactions to form things like carbon monoxide, nitrous dioxide, and particulate matter, and even formaldehyde. And those affect not only what you breathe inside your home, but around your home. Let's look at the supply chain issues first. So how do we get natural gas? Natural gas comes to us through fracking or hydraulic fracturing. What they do is they go in and they use excessive amounts of water with nasty chemicals to blast the oil from the rock. And these cause the water poisoning and ground contamination for people who live around them. Um, these extraction points are usually near concentrated areas of poverty and populations of color. So these people, they don't have the money to fight big oil. So that's why the oil companies put them there and they suffer the most. It's a huge environmental justice issue. Once extracted, the methane goes along the pipelines to get to your homes. Well, many of these homes are leaky and uh, old. There was a uh, study done recently, the Environmental Defense Agency teamed up with, um, with Google Maps and they mapped various cities in the United States showing their gas uh, leaks. And uh, here's Boston. Uh, Boston is near and dear to me because that's where my daughter lived. And so you can go in and zoom in and you can find exactly where your child lives in the cities. And you can see like my daughter lives right next to this big leak right here. Um, so it's not something that is, uh, as a parent, not anything that you can really want to embrace here. Okay. Um, in addition to the unplanned leaks, the oil companies deliberately vent and burn off, or they call it flaring, the methane as it travels through the system. They do this to regulate the pressure to prevent explosions. Unfortunately, we know that that venting, it, it doesn't always work. Uh, we locally, we've had uh, the San Bruno pipeline, which killed many, injured more, and damaged over 38 homes. Uh, we know that during earthquakes, the biggest damage usually comes from fires, from gas leaks. And then we aren't exempt in our own town of gas leaks. Last uh, August, I think it was, in South Los Altos, there was a house that got on fire uh, because of a gassy, a leaky gas meter. And many of, uh, a lot of times on next door, you see uh, people posting, what are these low flying helicopters? Well, um, they are people looking for gas leaks to repair. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me feel very comfortable. Um, in addition to how bad it's polluting the environment, it's polluting our homes, inside our homes. There's been studies before, but uh, last year the UCLA School of Public Health issued a study that has subsequently been uh, endorsed and talked about by reputable medical societies like the New England Journal of Medicine. Let me read just some of the results of the report. Even though exhaust fans should be used every time we turn on a burner, studies show only about 35% of us do. And even if you used your range hood 100% of the time, the UCLA study shows it only captures 40% of the fumes that come from your cooking. So that means the rest go in your air in your kitchen and, and percolate throughout the home. And after cooking for one hour with a gas stove and oven, peak levels of nitrogen dioxide inside the house are so high that they exceed both state and national outdoor air quality standards in more than 90% of the homes that were tested. Your children suffer the most. 
The children who grew up in a home with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop asthma than those who don't. And if you're an adult, you're not exempt because exposure to the combustion of pollutants of gas stoves increases wheezing, cough, bronchitis, and vulnerability to other infectious diseases like COVID. The worst appliances are the ones that don't vent to the outside of your house, like your gas stove. But even if they do vent to the outside, like sometimes our water and uh, furnaces do, they still put that harmful air into uh, the outside. So where do we use uh, natural gas in our home? This uh, donut, if you will, represents the average Californian household. And we say average in quotes because everybody's different in terms of how they use their natural gas. But um, generally speaking, this is your diagram of, of how much natural gas you use in your average home. The thing is, is where we are in the evolution of energy is that there's a viable electric appliance alternative to every single one of these spaces. We're at a time where we know that it's not healthy and that there's better alternatives. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Schmidt, our next speaker, because Steve has systematically been reducing his reliance on the use of methane in his home. And he has a company whose software analyzes smart meter data to help you reduce your carbon footprint. Let's hear how Steve's has done it. First, I have to unmute. Well, thank you, Connie, and thank you, Gary. I'm pretty excited to talk about this. These uh, beneficial electrification is the uh, combination of two topics that are near and dear to my heart. First is home energy efficiency. Been working on that for about 10 years and run a company that focuses on it for PG&E. And then the other topic is reducing your carbon footprint. And I've been working on that uh, for my own carbon footprint for about 15 years. Prior to that, I was actually a, a climate change denier. I didn't think it was real. But for 15 years, I've been working on that. So um, Lisa and I have lived here in Los Altos Hills for uh, almost 30 years now. Um, we raised our two kids here. They're launched and, and uh, doing fine. Uh, Lisa just got elected to our town council uh, a month or two ago, which is great. We're very excited about that. She was elected by a single vote, which is a, a wonderful confirmation that every single vote counts. So that's pretty good. Um, what I plan to do is, is talk about really three main things. One is um, that measuring uh, our home's energy use and our personal carbon footprint is really critical. Uh, because everyone's uh, situation is different. Second, I'll, I'll dig down a little bit into the energy side of things, um, uh, your, your home energy, and talk a little bit about uh, efficiency measures. And then I'll start uh, talk more about beneficial electrification and my, my personal uh, quest over the, over the past 10 or 15 years. And then summarize with a, a number of uh, simple steps that we can all take uh, to make progress on this. Okay, so uh, every home is different in the way it uses energy. We all have different things in our houses. We all do, do things differently. So uh, having analyzed 20 some thousand homes in California in their energy use using smart meter data, I can tell you personally, there are no two houses that are exactly the same in the way they use energy use. And the variation is enormous. So we have to measure our home's energy use. The other thing is, uh, our carbon footprint is unique. Um, depending on what we do, our activities, what we buy, what we use, how we use energy, our carbon footprint is totally unique. So in both those cases, it's critical that we measure them. This is, these are quotes from a scientist uh, and then also two famous management people. In order to manage something, you have to measure it. I love that last, the second quote, what's measured improves. Once you start measuring something, you find ways to improve it. So California has been measuring its greenhouse gas emissions for a number of years now. And this is a kind of a snapshot. So this is, the pie chart just shows, here's where the emissions come from for 2018. For, this is just for one year. And it, it breaks it down into a number of different 
uh, main categories like transportation or buildings or industry, whatever, those categories differ depending on who's doing the measuring and, and what, uh, what uh, scope uh, you're applying. But um, this is becoming more and more common and we're measuring it in more and more detail. Countries also measure their greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, again, this is fairly new. I mean, people have been measuring their ener ener energy use for probably over a century, maybe, maybe many centuries, but measuring greenhouse gas emissions is quite new. And there's a lot of nuances to it. But this, is, this particular chart is from uh, a friend at, at Stanford, Rob Jackson, who's been uh, doing a lot of work in this area. And they um, compared different countries over time. You can see that um, the USA, our emissions per capita have been dropping pretty substantially, which is great. But it also shows that when you compare apples to apples across a bunch of different countries, we've actually got a long ways to go. And that Americans are, uh, we're one of the worst countries in terms of per capita emissions. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, the more wealthy <laughs> individuals have uh, even higher emissions. I'm going to talk more about this slide later, uh, but it's, it's pretty compelling that it says that we have a lot of work to do. So I've also been really, <laughs> I, I, okay, I'm a little bit of a climate geek at this point, but I've actually tried to measure my footprint, my carbon footprint, going back to when I was born. So this is uh, 60 years of carbon emissions in a number of key categories. And we can all do this. This took me a while because I started it a long time ago, but it's in Excel. But uh, once you start figuring out where your emissions come from, it makes it much easier to, to find the simplest actions that you can take to have the biggest impact and the biggest reduction. So my first suggestion is to measure your carbon footprint. If you haven't done it before, there's a wonderful tool developed by Berkeley. It's really easy to use. It's totally free. You just click through a bunch of uh, survey questions and it will give you uh, an estimate of, of, of how your particular footprint compares to uh, other, other people, other, others in similar situations. What they generally find, it's not always true, but most of the time, there's two categories that really impact all of our footprints, and that is transportation and building energy use. So these are the, these are the big aspects. Now, uh, Connie mentioned that there's natural gas is a huge issue, and our uh, local energy provider, electricity provider, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, has been digging into this data. They have access now to all of our data for uh, how we use electricity and how we use gas. They don't provide us gas, but they uh, have the data from PG&E. So what this chart shows, it's, it's a complex chart. I don't, I don't want to scare you, but it's, it's a really nicely laid out chart. On the left, we're seeing the total amount of electricity and natural gas that goes through, uh, that, that is used by uh, customers of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And then it's broken down in the middle into a couple of main categories, like up here is residential gas. And then in the middle is commercial gas. And the same splits are done on electricity. And then on the far right, what we're seeing is which uses. Uh, Connie mentioned that space heating and water heating are the two biggest uses of, of natural gas. And this becomes very clear when you see this chart. Um, space heating is, is uh, Right up there with water heating, the two of those are the two main things that we use natural gas for. So if there's ways to reduce uh, those two uses and get off natural gas in those two uses, that's a huge gain in terms of reducing our footprint quickly. The, the third one down here is cooking. So uh, that, that applies to these induction cooktops, a great way to get off natural gas. So one, two, and three, I'm going to keep coming back to this. The space heating, water heating, these are the things in your home that we want to electrify to have the biggest impact on your carbon emissions. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about net, uh, electricity or, or energy use in your homes. And it's a very complex field. Uh, very few people really understand where their, where their energy use goes in their homes 
and whether it's typical or atypical, whether they use more than others. So we break down energy use, uh, an interesting way to think about it, into three categories. One is the energy used by your house uh, just because of the way it was built and the key things it has in, in it. Once you, the first time, the first day you move into a new house, it already has a certain level of insulation, a certain number of types of windows, single pane or double pane. Uh, it, it's, it leaks to some extent. How much it leaks is really dependent on the building itself. You're not gonna change that easily. Um, so that's the energy use that is characteristic of the building itself. Next, we put stuff in our homes. <laughs> we all have lots of stuff that we have in our homes. Um, and uh, these are just some simple things that have uh, grown over time in popularity. This is an Insta hot hot water dispenser. Turns out they use an amazing amount of electricity. Uh, wine fridges, uh, small dorm fridges, that old fridge in the garage, they, have, they consume a ton of energy. This is a heated baby wipe dispenser in the middle, which probably didn't exist when, when uh, we had when I had babies anyway, game consoles. This is all the stuff uh, they're generally referred to as plug loads. And that's a, com a completely different category of our energy use. And then finally, um, our behavior has a huge impact on how much energy we use in our homes. Whether we turn off lights when we leave a room, do we leave a TV going all day long? Is our computer running all day long? Um, does someone have a window open when the, when the furnace is on or when the air conditioning is on? These are all behavioral issues. Now, it used to be that the, the category on the left, the building, the way it was constructed was the dominant uh, indicator of how much energy a home would use. Now it can be any one of these three categories. Just the behavior of, of two families living side by side in very similar homes, there can be a four times difference in energy use. This has been a, a, the focus of a study just because of their behavior. So what we do uh, in our home energy analytics uh, service, which is a free service available to all pg and &E, uh, customers, is that we analyze your data, both your smart meter data for your electricity and your smart meter data for your natural gas use. And we can identify uh, in, in a number of categories where how you compare to other homes. So here we have two different homes, uh, both in roughly the same area. Their bills, this is their annual PG&E bill, uh, almost exactly the same. But when you break down their energy use, the house on the left has this, the big slice of the pie is red. That's, that's winter space heating. That house, uh, if, if, you were to, if you lived in this house and you wanted to reduce your energy use, that's what you would focus on. Compare that to the home on the right, where uh, the, over half of their energy use is going to what we call base loads or continuous loads. This is the stuff that's in the house. Um, any number of appliances are, are drawing energy or consuming energy when you're not even using them. So what we found by analyzing all this smart meter data is that there's far more homes that look like the one on the right <laughs> than there are in our area that look like the one on the left because our climate is, is pretty good. We don't spend near as much uh, energy on heating and cooling as do other parts of the country. So that's what we do. One of the motivations for this was that I was trying to figure out my home's energy use a long time ago. And uh, I wanted to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second. My daughter was uh, uh, 13 or 14 at the time. And I gave her one of these things. This is called a kilowatt meter. And you plug it in the wall. It costs like 20, 25 bucks on, uh, on Amazon. But you... Um, once you plug it into the wall, you can plug anything into it and measure how much energy it's using. So I asked my daughter, seems like a cool project, use this thing, go around the house, find everything that has a plug, plug it into this meter, write down how much energy it uses, and uh, we'll collect it all and figure out how much it is, because maybe that's why our bills are so high. So I figured it would take her a couple hours. She'd find 20 or 30 things. It took her weeks she found things plugged in all over the house, like under, under sinks and in closets and out in the garage and even outdoors, there were things plugged in. And she counted 93 things that were plugged in. And 
overall, these devices were using over 600 watts of energy, which if you know an old 100 watt incandescent light bulb, that is an amazing amount of energy that was being used all the time. So this was a huge surprise to all of us. And this tag cloud, that's what this is called, shows um, the different things she found and the size of the font is an indicator of how much energy it was using. So the aquarium, uh, we're not gonna do anything about that. My, Lisa loves the aquarium. We're not gonna get rid of it. It still uses a lot of energy, but there's a whole bunch of other things in here, like the uh, VCR player that's in the guest bedroom. It had been there probably three or four years, maybe longer before anyone had used it. Unplug the stupid thing. Then there's a surround sound system. That was in my son's room. He was in college. He wasn't even using it. Turns out there was a whole bunch of things that we could either put on timers, unplug, get rid of. These were things that were costing us money and using energy, and we just didn't know about it. It turns out this, uh, it may sound like maybe I'm just a we're, a, we're a consumer electronics crazy household, but it turns out this is fairly common. There's an awful lot of homes where this, these plug loads make up a huge portion of their total energy use. Um, so some examples of this, um, not necessarily plug loads, but uh, lighting. Uh, some of these outdoor lighting systems can have, they use halogen bulbs, which uh, used to be the best thing to use before LEDs came around. And you can spend $700 a year on an outdoor lighting system. We've these are these are real situations with real houses. Then there's the uh, bottom left is the continuous hot water recirculation pump. Many, many homes in this area have them, especially homes where the water heater is a long ways away from one or more uh, uh, faucets or showers or whatever. And these things are incredibly inefficient. If they're not on a timer, they're running your hot water through the house all the time. Of course, it cools every time it makes a loop around those copper pipes. So the water heater has to work extra hard using more natural gas to keep the water heated. Uh, we've, this is a, 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 an average of a whole bunch of water heaters that we found. They end up wasting about $400 of natural gas per year and $400 of electricity to run the pump per year. So that's $800 a year in a simple little device like that. And there are simple, simple solutions to that same issue. Then we've got a towel rack. And again, I'm gonna show, uh, show my towel rack. I, I often bring this to, bring, to do presentations. We were given it as a gift and it's a nice chrome, I don't know if you can see it, nice chrome towel rack. What you'll notice is that it has a, a plug and all the way to the end of the plug, there is no switch. The idea on this thing is you put it next to your shower and it keeps your towel nice and warm all the time, which is really pretty nice, but it's using electricity uh, uh, literally 24 by seven all year round at the tune of about 120 or 140 watts all the time. Now I like a good warm towel, but I'm not sure if I wanna spend $400 a year um, to, keep, to keep it warm. And then the last, uh, last one is refrigeration. Uh, old, old fridges are incredibly inefficient. The uh, uh, refrigeration industry has just made amazing progress over the last 20 or 30 years, thanks largely to uh, California state regulators, the CEC, Jeff Byron's on the call. He, we should all give him a big thank you because he was a, a commissioner at the CEC. <laughs> and the CEC mandated certain levels of efficiency uh, way back in the 70s for any refrigerator sold in California. And, and over time, they just kept ratcheting up those requirements. So fridges became more and more uh, efficient. So, um, so the old fridges are terrible. If you have a bunch of them uh, in your house uh, spread out, consider uh, getting rid of them. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about my own personal quest. I, I had, uh, had heard probably in the mid 2000s that the UN says, the United Nations says, that if we're all gonna live on this planet in 2050 and not destroy the climate, we have to have a per capita greenhouse gas emissions level of less than one metric ton per person per year. So at the time, uh, I was up over 30. 
And I, I couldn't find a really good argument for why I should be allowed in 2050 <laughs> to, to pollute way more <laughs> than anyone else. So I set myself a target to try and see what life was like at that, uh, that level of carbon emissions. So um, last year I made it. So I went from a high of 30 metric tons per year down to less than one. And it was really just a couple of key things. And the list is, is on the left. It was switching to clean electricity so that now I can use as much electricity as I want. I, I we don't really want to do that, but it's not contributing to my emissions. Getting a heat pump water heater, getting a heat pump uh, furnace and air conditioner, uh, switching to induction for cooking, getting electric vehicles instead of gas, instead of using gas, using less meat. And, and another big one is flying less. Now, when I describe this to people, uh, usually the, the main reaction is, what? You're not flying? And true, we've been really cutting down on our flying. I haven't gotten on a plane in a couple of years, but there are way fun ways to have uh, adventures and travel. And these are some of our trips around the, around the country. Uh, this was a, a, a conversion project. Uh, my son and I built him an electric MG midget. This was an a, a old school bus that we converted to run on waste vegetable oil. <laughs> and we drove it around the country. Lisa and I and two dog, big dogs drove it around the country. You can take Amtrak. Amtrak has some of the best routes uh, around the country. We go on bike trips. We've now got a Tesla. We have a trailer that we tow behind the Tesla. We've taken some great EV road trips uh, in, the, in the Tesla. These, these things are all extremely low carbon. So th the good news is there's a lot of things you can do, uh, which are still uh, what I would consider at least a very high quality of life. Okay, so now we're circling back to beneficial electrification. So there's just four simple steps that each one of us can take to have a huge reduction in our personal carbon footprint. So here's a, uh, this pie chart represents kind of a typical Bay Area home and the, the four main sources of greenhouse gas emissions for that home. Some come from electricity in the blue, some come from gasoline because they're driving their cars, that's the dark red, some come from natural gas. And then there's a bunch of other stuff, whether that's meat or the things they buy, or it could be the water they use, it could be uh, sewage, any number of things. So with four actions, you can cut this pie chart down to just these small slices. So it's like over a 75% reduction in your carbon footprint from doing four things. Okay, so what are they? First, most of you have already done this, I imagine. You convert to 100% clean electricity. Silicon Valley Clean Energy was the first CCA uh, in California that, that defaulted to carbon-free electricity. This is fantastic. Um, next, you, you and, and that got rid of that blue <laughs> pie, slice of the pie that was representing emissions from your electric use. That's gone now. Now you upgrade uh, off gasoline to electric vehicles. That gets rid of that dark red. And there, this used to be difficult because there were very few cars. There are some great electric vehicles now. If you haven't um, tried one recently, ask somebody to give you a ride in a Tesla and you won't go back. Nobody does. They're, they're just great cars. Then these next two are the uh, tackling the orange, the natural gas thing that we're, we're focusing on here. Natural gas is a huge problem for greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can replace your water heater with a heat pump water heater and replace your furnace with a heat pump a uh, space conditioner that also provides air conditioning, you get rid of a big chunk of this uh, orange slice. And, and the last couple in that orange slice are cooking. So go to induction and then wash your, uh, drying your clothes. And there are some great uh, solutions there as well. So heat pumps are a key issue. We are so far behind on this. The rest of the world has already figured this out. They are so efficient that it just makes sense. For some reason, North America is particularly late to this party, but that's changing quickly. And um, what we wanna do is, is address any questions any of you have about this or encourage you to, to look into it. So let's focus in on this um, 
what, one particular device, which is your hot water heater. We're going to do a poll now. Gary's going to set that up. And um, what we would like to just ask is, do you, what kind of water heater do you have now? Is it a natural gas water heater that has a big tank? Uh, it could be a tankless water heater. Um, it could be uh, a traditional electric water heater. Those are pretty rare around here because electricity is so expensive. Uh, it could be a really efficient brand new heat pump water heater, uh, or maybe you don't know. Uh, and then there's other things like solar uh, and some other ones. All right, so. Hey, we're, look. we're getting there. We've got 22, 23. Almost everybody's voted. Turns out I can't vote on my own poll here, so that's why we're <laughs> never get 100%. Same. This, this is about what we expect. I see, a, uh, I see at least one heat pump water heater, yay. Yay for two. And, and the I don't know is, is a very common response. <laughs> <laughs> Many people don't know what kind of water heater they have. OK. I think we've got uh, most of us still have natural gas water heaters with a tank. I'm going to end the poll now and yep. share the results. Great. So three quarters. Yeah. So uh, by far, uh, we use natural gas to heat our water. And it's a huge amount of energy. Um, at, at, uh, as, as Silicon Valley Clean Energy, that chart that I showed you, it's, it's, a, um, it's one of the biggest single categories of energy use. All right, so now I'm gonna stop. Gary, can you, oh, hang on, I just got rid of the ball. Okay, so diving down a little bit more into, into hot water heaters, it may seem like an obtuse topic, but it's, it's really useful to understand just how efficient these new heat pump water heaters are. So let's say you wanted to make some hot water and, and it, uh, the, the amount of energy that it takes to make hot water obviously varies based on how hot you want it to be and how much of it you're heating up. But uh, a BTU is a unit of energy. So I, I say, let's figure out uh, different ways to make a hundred BTUs of hot water. Turns out that's about a, a cup of, of uh, steamy hot water. Okay, so if you wanted to do that, you could you do it several different ways. You could use your natural gas, 75% of you had a natural gas tanked water heater. And the one you can, there's one you can buy at Home Depot right now that has an efficiency factor of 0.58. That means 58% uh, of the energy that it consumes gets converted into hot water. So to make 100 BTUs of hot water, you would have to use 172 BTUs of natural gas. Now the one on the bottom left is a tankless water heater, tankless natural gas water heater. Several of you have those. That's more efficient. So it's 79% efficient, which means that it would take only 127 BTUs of natural gas to make your, your little cup of steamy hot water. Then we move to electric. Electric resistance hot water heaters are very efficient. So 93% efficient. That means 108 BTUs of electricity will be used to make you that steamy cup of hot water. But here's the big winner. <laughs> the heat pump water heaters are not actually creating the heat like these other three. They're not combusting anything. Um, they're moving heat from one place to another, just the way your refrigerator works in your kitchen. Your refrigerator takes the heat out of the inside of the fridge and dumps it into your kitchen. That's why that's, it's always warm close to the refrigerator. It's dumping heat that it moved out of the refrigerator. A heat pump water heater does the same thing. And you can get one now that uses only 33 BTUs of electricity to make 100 BTUs of hot water. This is amazing. And this is what the rest of the world has figured out. It's incredibly efficient and they work great. We installed ours about a year and a half ago. It works great. We can actually shift schedule it so that it doesn't run during peak times which is also an added benefit. It never runs uh, during the, 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 the really expensive electric times when the grid is already overloaded. Okay, so coming to simple steps, things that each of us can do that are free uh, related to these three categories, related to home energy, uh, travel, and then just other stuff. So these are all related to reducing our carbon footprint. So if you haven't already done so, you ought to switch to SVCE. 
uh, for your electricity. Try our home Intel program. I, I, I guarantee you'll learn something about the energy use uh, in your home. Lower your heat pump water heater. These are all free things. Fly, take one less flight over the next year. That has a huge impact. Drive a little bit less, bike more, walk more, eat less meat, measure your carbon footprint with this Cal uh, Berkeley tool. Buy a little less stuff, <laughs> that has a huge impact. Then in terms of spending a little bit of money, uh, prep for electrification. What that means is get your house ready uh, by running conduits or making sure there's an electric outlet close to where your hot water heater is. These are things you can do now so that when your water heater does give out on a right before a big party or something, then you'll be prepared to get that hot water heater in there. Uh, an induction cooktop, uh, you can get them now for 40 bucks, I think, just a little one. And they're, they're amazingly efficient and, and very fast. Um, there's a, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, the big ones are, of course, uh, migrating off natural gas through these beneficial electrification uh, measures we're talking about, getting off gasoline, switching to an electric vehicle, flying less, and then finally eating less meat. Those are really the big ones. Okay, so summarizing. Uh, first, make sure you're getting clean electricity. Once you've got clean electricity, you can use it to um, power all your devices, both transportation and your home. You, you should also measure your own uh, lifestyle, both in terms of your carbon footprint uh, through this Berkeley calculator and in terms of your home energy use. And that's our, our service, again, free to everybody. So uh, once you've got clean electricity and you've analyzed it, then you can switch to electric vehicles and install some heat pumps. And this is really something we have to do as Americans fairly quickly. We have to get onto these heat pump appliances in a big way by 2030, if, if the scientists are right. So that means hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these devices have to be deployed very quickly. So it's a big challenge. Okay, the final poll. Gary's gonna toss this one up. Did you see something in our presentation today so that makes you a, think, a ah, really I can- long poll. There are a lot of things that people are gonna have to, this is multiple choice, right? I, I, I believe so, yes. So if you can throw up the poll, they can kind of scan through it and uh, you probably have to scroll. scroll. Uh-oh, did I do that? Yeah, you did. But here we go with the poll, launching poll. Yeah, so take your so, time there. It's multiple choice, so just go down. If you like anything you see, click it and Yeah, and, and really it's a, it's, a, it's a way to spur maybe some discussion that we have 10 more minutes for is uh, wh what kind of things are the easiest ones, the most attractive? Uh, eating less meat, I see that. Switching to an EV. Oh, look at it. Oh my gosh, there's stuff all over the place. This is great. Oh, this, this, is, this is a good audience. <laughs> yeah, they're ready to, ready to lead, obviously. <laughs> I have to say, Steve, you are truly amazing and what an inspiration. I think that's part of, part of what we're seeing here. People are inspired, including me. Gary, what are you going to do? You've already oh, done I'm everything. I'm going to put in a, a, a heat pump water heater, of yes. course. <laughs> I didn't even mention the rebates. Silicon Valley Clean Energy has some amazing rebates on heat pump water heaters right now. Okay, so we've got 74% of the people voting. Oh, this is great. 26, I'll wait for one more person, then I'll close it. 27, there we go. This is the end of the poll now. Sorry if you missed it, but we got... Good, good, good. Go, go through it, Steve. Tell us what we got. Oh, this is fantastic. So a lot of people are motivated to go measure their greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a key step because, as I said, everybody's different. So go off and do that. The Berkeley poll, um, it, it shouldn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, reduce your energy use is always good, uh, especially natural gas. The focus now is not so much on electricity because it's clean, more about natural gas. And then uh, prep for a heat pump water heater. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Connie, we're making a difference here. This is great. <laughs> All right, so now I think we're, we're good for uh, the final slide and any Q&A. Is that right, Gary? I think so. Uh, in fact, uh, take a look at this. And, and just to let people know, we are recording this and it will be posted uh, either on the Greentown website or maybe we'll put it on YouTube, but we'll let you know wherever it ends up. And that can happen pretty quickly. Um, 
we do have a few questions in the chat. We do. Uh, uh, we do. Um, quite a few about heat pump water heaters, by the way. You want to grab those, Connie, and read them? Of course. Um, I did attempt to answer a question, but one was regarding air conditioning. And um, it's confusing at first. There's two different types of heat pumps. There's one to heat your water. Then there's another technology to heat your home. And when you use that one, just by virtue of the way that it's designed, which is kind of like a refrigerator, you get AC as for free, basically. So um, yes, heat pumps will give you both cooling and heating. So Steve, um, I'm gonna ask you to stop the screen share and then we can go to a, a view where we'll be able to see each other. If you go to, if you go to a, uh, I wanna make a you. shout out to Nick. Thank you for um, li listing in the chat, the link to the Redwood Redwood Energy uh, electrification guide that just came out and it's fantastic, so. So I've got it in gallery view myself and uh, I can see a lot of folks. Some people have uh, not engaged their or enabled their video, uh, but that's fine. But it's, it's good to see everybody. This is a kind of a classroom setting and it, it's fun to, uh, to see, see who else is taking the class. Yeah, so one of the questions is uh, regarding the differential in performance between electric uh, stove and induction cooktop. Um, I have personal experience going from gas to induction. I don't know, uh, Steve or Gary, if you wanna take on that question. My wife, Lisa, was skeptical. She's the chef in the house. And uh, we, so we got a small single burner one to begin with. And it was key to get one that was powerful enough. Um, but once she started using that for about a month, she was converted. I gave one to my daughter and she loves it. Yeah. Now, I, now you I, have to ask, why don't I have one? <laughs> I, have a, um, I have a hot plate, an induction hot plate that I bought about a year ago and it sits next to an unused four burner uh, Thermador gas stove. I will not go back, I love it. There's a question from Laura. Hi, Laura, uh, about have you found that the limited electric service, uh, the main panel is a constraint uh, in, in beneficial electrification? And we, we definitely ran into that problem. We have a 200 amp, amp panel uh, for the whole house, but most of our electrification gadgets we're on the other end of the house on a hundred amp panel. So we were able to do all the stuff we did, which was a heat pump water heater, heat pump furnace, uh, to charge two electric vehicles, uh, put in the induction cooktop. We replaced a, uh, an old dryer with a uh, 120 volt condensing washer dryer. So all you need is a, is a normal outlet for that one. But the trick we found there's a, a new class of devices called smart splitters that allow you to use one circuit, like one 30 amp circuit can be used to split across two different functions. So we have two of them in the house uh, and we use one so that we could use the same 30 amp circuit to charge two different electric vehicles. It's smart enough to know when, when one is going, it shuts off the other one and so forth. And then the other one we use to split a 30 amp circuit between the induction range in the induction cooktop and the heat pump water heater. And in that case, whenever the, the induction cooktop is turned on, the heat pump water heater goes off. But we don't care about that. We don't need to be making hot water while we're also cooking. So these smart splitters are really uh, useful for that particular issue. Yeah, that's a good hint. Uh, while we've got Jeff on the line here still, Jeff Byron, uh, thank you for your help moving California in the right direction. That was a big lift at the time. Appreciate it. Well, that's, that's very kind of Gary and, and Steve, but I have to say I wasn't around at the Energy Commission in the 70s, Steve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, I, we appreciate it. <laughs> if I could add just a quick comment, you know, it, it seems a little bit contradictory when you ask us all to use less energy by unplugging things and, and, uh, um, and or putting them on timers uh, uh, to then say, let's electrify the whole house. Uh, and use more electricity. Uh, but in, uh, uh, what's behind both of those things is saving money. Because uh, if you reduce 
um, if you reduce the production of GHG and reduce the effect of climate change, but really at the end of the day, both things save consumers a lot of money. That's why I did it. I electrified everything. And uh, the one you didn't mention, Steve, that we really love is we took out, we, we flat out took out the chimney in our house when we did a remodel and put in a, an electric fireplace. And it's far, far more romantic than burning yes. wood. <laughs> I've seen this. It's amazing. They have one with water vapor. It looks completely real. Oh, no, we couldn't afford that. We didn't do the water vapor, but oh. it's just, yeah, but, but it's really nice. So, so I, I thank you both very much for your incredible dedication and uh, demonstration of, of this. And, and I'm really encouraged to see all these folks online uh, listening uh, to all this great information. Uh, we, are, we are getting a question from Margaret Suozo. Uh, can you comment on the cost of ASHPs? Which I'm assuming is I'm not sure alternating I know speed heat pumps. Is that right, Margaret? Oh. Oh, sorry, air source heat pumps. Oh, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because so, a number of a number of people actually have been looking to install them and are kind of con kind of shocked by the the cost. And so I know you know uh, we have some predictions about the future of gas prices and everything, but just general cost um, analysis if you have it. Yes. So right now it's about even in terms of the operating cost of a new gas uh, appliance and a new electric heat pump. They've gotten so efficient that even if a gas appliance that's using gasoline, the, the price of the fuel is much cheaper. The efficiency of the heat pump is now four or five times that uh, the, the efficiency of the gas device. So all, all electricity, our electricity is pretty ex expensive, but it's not five times <laughs> more than gas on a per BTU basis. It's, it's close to that but it's not quite. So right now it's, it's uh, about cost competitive and that will just keep getting better over time. The technologies keep improving, natural gas prices will definitely uh, go, be going up and hopefully electricity prices, especially for all electric homes will start to go down. And also you, know, you'll, you'll have to, you'll, you also have to factor in uh, you know, the cost of your health somewhere in there. You put a price on the clean air that you breathe in your home. That's right, that too, of course. Um, thanks to everybody, this is wonderful. Uh, great start to the series, there's nine more to go. And the one coming up next Thursday, two days from now, and I'll send out a fresh Zoom link to you so you'll have that as well as everybody else who was not able to make it today. It's by Allison Hicks, who's a council member uh, in Mountain View. And she's gonna tell us about good urban planning and why that's important to cities and, and really why it's important to your mental and physical health. So I hope to see you on Thursday. And on that, it's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, everyone.